We live in a system where if you ruffle the wrong feathers and those people have a lot more money and a lot more political connections than you, you're going to have a really bad time. I, I was arrested under the Terrorism Act, Schedule 7. It's one of the only times you don't have a right to remain silent. I have no criminal record despite popular belief. I literally got a letter from the Australian government saying I had to stop involving myself in politics altogether if I wanted to be in that country. They just want that feedback loop and the content creators making that content get a lot of money. How many different times? can we say it? It's a vicious cycle and I almost can't even be mad. They wanted to create a villain because that's what people love to see and I was just the blonde cute villain that they could create at the time. You nailed the Tucker Carlson prediction. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. That's, I, I kind of feel like... What's motivating you now? Because I, I sense not only the, the frustration but almost some regret. I can't help but feel you sound a little defeated. I actually have something I care about and I want to protect. Welcome back to another episode of The Meet Kevin Show. It has been three years since we last confronted Lauren Southern. And I think you're probably best to introduce yourself, but I want to start with, apparently not only are you banned from Airbnb, but your blood is banned from Airbnb. You got, uh, you were part of a show with Tucker Carlson, but then after he got canned, that got canned. Uh, you're banned from Patreon. You've been demonetized plenty of times. Wikipedia does not love you. What is going on, Lauren Southern? And thank you for coming back. It's been almost three years. I really like how you're almost legally obligated to refer to this as confronting me instead of interviewing me, <laughs> because anything other than that means accepting the person banned from every platform banking institution Wikipedia hates, you know? No, um, I said, I have a friend of mine who has an excellent quote, maybe he stole it from someone, but it was, it's better to be uh, wrong too late than right too early. Because like if that. you're if you're right too early, if you're the berserker going in, you're just gonna hit the machine gun fire. The people who kind of wait back and are like, I'm gonna let you guys go first with your opinions that are a little dangerous. Like you can look at this with Black Lives Matter, you know, criticizing the protesters. The first people that came out as critics, maybe questioning should we be burning down cities? Canceled, 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 right? Wow. Now it's pretty normal to question that. Yeah. The first people who came out and said, hey, you know, this mass immigration stuff might really be affecting our economy in Canada and our housing market. Um, let's let's look into that. Racist, canceled from shows. Now that's a pretty normal talking point, even in regular mm. magazines in Canada. Mm. A lot of, I mean, the thing that I was probably the most canceled for ever was a video I did called The Great Replacement, in which I literally just described Renaud Camus' philosophy. He was a French philosopher who said, um, when you have one population in a time span, and then within a certain amount of time, they're replaced with another population through various means, immigration, whatever, that's replacement politics. And I described mm -hmm. it in this video didn't say whether this is an amazing, good or bad thing, right? Yeah. But wow, I got in a lot of trouble for that. Like that got me labeled as a white nationalist, Nazi, this, none of those things, <laughs> you know, none of those things. But now Tucker Carlson has talked about it. Vivek yeah. Ramaswamy, all Vivek, yeah. Vivek like cake. Got it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that have, the thing that I've been the most canceled for is now being talked about by some of the biggest commentators that are n nowhere near banned from countries the way I have been, but I was a little uh, early. <laughs> so what do you think most people consider you on the political spectrum? And then what do you consider yourself? If I take a political spectrum test, I land pretty, I, I'm embarrassed to say it because I understand the uh, connotation, but I actually land pretty centrist when I take a political spectrum mm -hmm. test myself. Um, but Border Patrol doesn't think so. You were autism spectrum, <laughs> that's a little bit. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what were we talking about? <laughs> no, no. Um, Border tell us, Patrol don't yeah. agree. Last, yeah, so, but if you ask people based on my Wikipedia, because mm -hmm. you know, people don't, grow up or portray their opinions differently. They don't get misrepresented. I'm just like a straight up neo-Nazi that wants to kill immigrants in the, you know, Mediterranean Sea. That is not true, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter once an opinion has been formulated about you by the masses. So I, I tend to prioritize relationships and conversations with people who are actually interested in getting to know what I think rather than concerning myself with the thoughts of people who have already decided. How has that affected you? Um, I mean, it's hard to say that 
it hasn't massively impacted my life, right? Yeah. I, I, it, it's to the point of affecting every aspect of my life, my yeah. ability to travel, my ability to get jobs, my ability to rent places, get a mortgage, everything. Like it, rent places, you've been denied rentals because of your Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, well, like this is a thing for I have friends that are in media industry that aren't even controversial like me that they have trouble just because they have a public profile. Like you think, and, and people are worried, oh, there's someone with a public profile living in my house. Mm -hmm. They might, you know, someone might try to find where they live. It might end up on the internet or whatever. So then you think of someone like me, you Google my name, <laughs> you're getting some interesting results, right? Oh. And it doesn't really matter if they are true or not. Yeah. People are just concerned about that. We live in a day mm -hmm. and age where association is very important. Mm -hmm. We're in this like soft communism where you can be canceled by association. You can lose your job by association. My parents got banned from B&B &B for the crime of being related to me, tell, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I, 2018, 20, I think it was 2019, I got banned from Airbnb, which was crazy because I had already taken a step back from politics. They sent me a message saying, Due to your political persuasion and connections, we have taken down your our Airbnb account and you can't use our site anymore. So literally due to my politics. And then I believe it was last year, my parents were booking a nice little getaway. And, you know, they I I am not the voice of my parents. They are their own people with their own opinions and their own lives. Mm. Um, and Airbnb sent them a message based on, I, I'd have to get the exact writing, but it was essentially based on who you are related to and connected to, we have shut down your Airbnb account. And I the don't- parent, your My parents. parents, my parents. So that's, once again, by blood relation, this is full on Nazi communist regime stuff. <laughs> Which they're accusing you of. Oh, it, it, the irony is yeah. endless. You know, it, yeah. this is always the quote online. Imagine the other way around or the hypocrisy. And you can scream about it all day long, but that is just the system we live in. Mm. We live in an extraordinarily hypocritical time <laughs> where the people screaming Nazi are the first one that will put you in front of the firing wall, vice versa. Um, my, yeah, my parents were pretty upset because, it, you know, as much as they've had their life impacted by just even emotionally by having to watch what I've been through, getting calls like, hey, we've got your daughter arrested in Calais and she's getting questioned under the Terrorism Act. Like, you know, that does a number to parents <laughs> who, uh, you know, get those calls in the yeah. first thing in the morning. Your daughter's in jail in Turkey right now and we don't know if she'll be released, you know? Like, that definitely does a number. So I've calmed down a bit. <laughs> well, wait, <laughs> so you've changed your behavior because of this, but like what behavior? I mean, like, is it just like expressing your opinion and, and and making videos online or what do you mean when you say you've calmed down um well you you have to i learned very quickly what i thought cuz i came from a, a very normal you know working class family I, I didn't come from any sort of house of cards powerful you yeah. know elite family that's going to know what's going on and how the world totally works you know we know the basics of, of life yeah. and i was taught everything that a kid you'd think a kid would need to know but i definitely went into the world being like yeah i can say my opinion i can free just speech, speak freely all. free speech um I'm allowed, no matter who I am and, and what my background is, to start a business, to live my life. And that is just not how it works. Mm -hmm. We live in a system where if you ruffle the wrong feathers and those people have a lot more money and a lot more political connections than you, you're going to have a really bad time. A really bad time. <laughs> and and that doesn't even necessarily matter, the, the politics. Like if I ruffle the feathers just by being too famous and taking up too much of a slice of the pie within the right wing circle that might ruffle feathers in there to get you taken out, especially if you don't have the resources or connections to defend yourself. But definitely most of my experience was criticizing governments. And I oh, wow. spent most of my focus criticizing governments worldwide and repeatedly found myself being banned from those countries, whether it be the UK where I went in and I was like, you're banned from the UK. I'm ba I, I was denied entry from the UK and I don't know if I would ever be allowed to return a especially considering, um, you know, I've, I've put in inquiries and I was, I, I was ar arrested under the Terrorism Act, Schedule 7. It's one of the only times you don't have a right to remain silent. Oh, wow. You legally do not have a right to remain silent. And I was 
tw- 21 years old. What were you doing? Why, what, what would cause the British government to arrest you under the terrorism? The, after, I can't even remember, it was like eight, nine, 10, 11 hours or so that I was like questioning, detained. Um, they gave me a letter saying that I was, my entry was rejected by Homeland Security, whoever it was there, un- under accusations of racism and wanting to cause racial tension. But what was fascinating about that was the alleged racial tension was me holding a pride parade, kind of a mock-up YouTube video pride parade in the city of Luton. So what inspired that was Vice News had put out an article saying Jesus was transgender. And I was like, okay, fine, Vice. That's that's very edgy, right? Wow, you've really uh, stuck it to the Christians. Jesus is transgender. How new and original. And I, I think that criticism of religion should be allowed. Sure. I, I really do. Whatever, no matter how ridiculous it's being, I think that should be allowed. But the problem is when you have these people that are pretending to be so edgy to question the orthodoxy of religion, but you know they'd never do it in a way that would actually threaten their career mm. or really ruffle feathers because they're all just clout chasers and wanting to climb the corporate ladder to improve Uh, their reputations, more clicks, all of that. So uh, an orthodoxy that everyone is way too afraid to question would be radical Islam, particularly Mm -hmm. because people get beheaded when they do. Right. You know, Charlie right. Hebdo, right? Uh, well, the yeah, terror walk into Paris people. and people get shot, basically. But more than that, rifles. more than horrible. that, it's just within the kind of progressive hierarchy, white Christians are very acceptable to attack, kind of like white males, all of that. But if you get into different racial groups, different faiths, then, well, Vice News isn't going to be so keen on doing a piece criticizing brown, you know, non-Christian religions. Uh. And so that it's just like, I'm like, okay, you could do, you could say the same thing. You could do an article saying Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad was yeah. transgender, but you won't. Mm. And I kind of wanted to do a video like going in front of a church and having like a pride parade in front of a church and seeing how people reacted within that community. And then having a, because pride parade is something that's very celebrated within yeah, the progressive belief. And then doing it in front of in a Muslim area and seeing the reactions and being like, okay, you're going to get a way stronger reaction from one community than the other. And yet the community you're criticizing as extraordinarily homophobic is always the community that seems to have less of a visceral reaction (laughs) to this stuff, right? So I was going to do this compare and contrast video, but I wasn't actually allowed back into the UK to do the Christian part of it because after I did the little pride parade event in Luton, the police threatened to arrest me for breaching the peace. I wasn't attacking anyone. I just had a little pride parade. I had my gay friends with me and a few other people handing out flyers. And uh, people were screaming, like spitting at us. And the police were like, you guys are going to get attacked. You are breaching the peace. You got to get out of here. We're going to arrest you. I always listen. I always try to comply. This is why I have no criminal record, despite popular belief. And we left, but they did ban me for racism for that, which is fascinating because last Mm. time I checked, Islam is not a race and Mm. uh, your sexuality is not a race either. So they just really pulled that one out of the backside. It sounds like pushing the boundaries can not only get you banned apparently from entering countries, but then also caught up at borders. You had mentioned before uh, we were sitting down here that you've spent, you've missed tens of thousands of dollars of flights being stuck in questioning at entry points. Yeah, and this is something that, I mean, I'm just gonna build on this in one hand. If you have ever met or spoken to someone who works in the policing, like Fed, intelligence, any kind of sphere like that, and you think about the lawsuits that they put up against J6ers or any sort of protesters, left-wing or right-wing, Antifa, pipeline protesters, They will tell you the point of these lawsuits, these investigations, these arrests isn't necessarily because they think they're going to win or because they have any sort of case whatsoever. It's for the purpose of distraction and wasting your time. The process is the punishment. The process is the punishment, exactly. Mm. And they know as long as they keep you hooked Mm. up in all of these legal battles, many of them completely frivolous, and they may know so as well, that you're not going to have time to do whatever you were doing before. And that very much became my life after the height of my career. It was like I had the height of my career doing politics, criticizing all these governments, and then everything after that 
was just governments banning me from places, sending me letters, threatening to shut down my oh, websites, gosh. banks, everything, to the point where eventually I literally got a letter from the Australian government saying I had to stop involving myself in politics altogether if I wanted to be in that country. And at you that were time, living in Australia. At that time, I was married to an Australian, and we were. You got going evicted to be from living. Australia. Well, no, they told me I wouldn't be allowed in the country where you know I had family if I didn't quit politics altogether. Oh wow! Yeah, so the government did eventually manage to shut me down completely, and yeah, and for all that time, I was also on secondary screening for flights. So anytime I had to fly anywhere, visit family, or if I did even want to still work, I had to show up for flights four hours early. And even so, uh, that didn't necessarily mean I was going to make it. Oh. And they, you don't get a refund. They'd held me for eight hours, you know, at times. Just asking me questions that they had asked me a thousand times before. It was crazy making. Like I have been in hundreds of hours of questioning sessions oh where they're just like, what's your name? Where are you from? Tell us about your documentaries. Tell us about the videos you've made. Explain this video. And every time like asking me the same question, same question, same question, legitimate crazy making. And then I'd miss my flight and they'd be like, we need you to stay for another four hours. And what they would do is because they didn't have the grounds to necessarily like ban me from America, a lot mm. of this happened with the US, they would just say, well, you've missed your flight and we can keep you here for 14, 20, 30 more hours. Um, or you can just withdraw your application to enter the just US. Just don't come in. Wow. Yeah. So I just repeatedly have to withdraw my application to enter oh. for two years. That was a thing that happened where I just, they would just hold me for long enough that I missed every flight and did, never got a refund. And at that time during COVID, a lot of the only flights to Australia and to Canada to visit my family back and forth were through the U.S. because oh. of all the flight cancellations. So, you know, prevented from seeing family. In, in some cases, my last flight from Australia to Canada to come to the funeral of family members and see family I hadn't seen in a year, they told me we need all of your computers, devices, uh, passwords, or you don't get to see your family. Oh and gosh. at that point, I had been so emotionally beat down and so detached from the people that I loved. And it was like my grandmother's funeral, who was so close to me, who I love so much. You, The government will literally get you to a point where it's just like, I don't care. Like, I'm sorry. Take it. Like, that's my rights being violated. Yeah. I feel violated. I feel like I, you have just completely, vi like, you know, I have no rights of my own, but fine, you win. Like, Do you think <laughs> people could make this comparison to your situation and then th the same power that was oppressing you but in the opposite form supporting someone like Jeffrey Epstein. How do you mean? So like the power of the government protecting all of the politicians associated with Jeffrey Epstein and the non-prosecution agreements protecting Alan Dershowitz and uh, Jeffrey Epstein. 100%. The same power. A single, uh, if you have a journalist that would have been early days looking into this, 1000%, mm -hmm. you would have had people with all of these connections calling up, oh, this journalist, they're trying to get to a conference over here where they're going to be speaking on an event about us. You know, um, put them, put a little like flag on their passport, get them pulled in, make wow. sure they miss their flight. And, you know, you'll never be able to prove that necessarily. Yeah, you won't yeah. know who Random did it. screening. Random screening. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. You, and it's very <laughs> crazy making. It's yeah. completely crazy it's making. Hey, by the way, if you're interested in trading or the stock market, financial news every morning at 525 a.m. Pacific time, when the stock market is open, I run a stock market open live stream where we cover all of these topics, the news of the day, what's going on, what to look for in trading or financial news, what the Wall Street analysts are saying, what my thoughts are on what they're saying, and much more. So check that out in the link down below. That is the Meet Kevin Stock Market Open live stream channel. I don't know who put me on secondary screening, but I know it was someone in Seattle. I've gotten little bits of information, like a random agent that, you know, through an airport I didn't even go through. So maybe it was just an activist. Maybe oh, wow. it was something more sinister. But they so right over there. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, like I was able, you know, to get little pieces of information here and there, because I, I think I explained this to you before, like through all of these questioning sessions, there's a bit of cross-pollination. Like I don't think they got 
any information from me that wasn't already public or online, I ain't no snitch. <laughs> but um, no, I'm serious. But like, I also wasn't doing anything illegal. Yeah. Like I genuinely, I'm like, yeah, you have literally held me here, questioned me, tormented me, held me from family, like psychologically just tried to destroy me and you still have nothing on me. I am not in jail. I have no criminal record. Like I know I'm fine. I know everything I'm doing is fine until we ban free speech for real, for real here, right? Um. But I did learn things about from them, you know, the types of questions they would ask me, the groups they would ask me about. I'm like, oh, so that's what you guys are looking into right now. Like, that's your modus operandi. That's yeah. what you're focusing on. So it's the, the <laughs> flashlight has moved from Lauren Southern on to other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does yeah. that give you an opportunity for new opt like new activism in 2024? Like, what are your focuses? <sighs> I, I won't lie. Like, I think I was explaining this. Y you've talked about it. You're like, wow, you aren't that active on your channel, Lauren. And it's true. I have, and even when I am, I, I'm a little g trigger shy, if, if that's like a reverse mm. word. I'm a little gun shy because it's like, I don't know you've messed up so much of my life because of the things I've said literally when I was like a teenager, <laughs> like 20, 21 years old, right? Um, it's been scarring. It's been a bit scarring. It's like, do I really want to get involved really shaking things up? And I have moments where I'm like, I do. But even, even then, like so much of the political sphere is very focused on the financial opportunity of people's like collective hope towards certain ideas and like okay how can we monetize this and mm. and i get it like you need money to do things but i think it's become way too focused on that um just that corporate it's like, media corporate yeah corporate media, focus, media that now it's not only like the government that you're competing against and which was it used to be this like real collective in 2015 of people who were super interested in this and got involved in it and were making their own little home videos and stuff but now it's like if you kind of threaten the corporate regime that's like listen we got a good thing going here we've got our donors we've got our um the opinions that we've created that are acceptable for our audience and we like them being in this feedback loop of those opinions don't take them out of that don't say things that may disturb the donors don't say things that might you know ruffle the feedback loop of money making that we're in right now uh, it's it's a very scary environment and i really feel like i'm in a point i you know i'm I'm really in this point of like data collection and like understanding better because I am aware of the position I'm in. I'm not wealthy. I am not uh, from a family with like strings that they can pull in the background. I don't have all these big connections. I'm just me. And I feel like I probably spend a lot more time like analyzing how the system is working and understanding how I can contribute maybe in small ways behind the scenes, meaningful ways behind the scenes. And then if I have an opportunity to contribute things I think are meaningful on my own channel or in movies I make, I do that. But I'm still in this kind of data collection phase of realizing I went into this whole political world blind and got myself really messed up on all fronts, financial, political, social. And now I'm like, okay, it's time for you to sit down and realize you don't know everything and it's time to learn a bit more. And so, it's humbling. It's good. It's good. I was a bit of an idiot. And it's nice being humbled. And both my both in my opinions and in my way of operating. I've grown in a lot of it. I was actually about to ask about that. So obviously your behavior's changed, but what how have your political opinions changed since you were 19, 20, 21? <laughs> it's hard being asked that because there are people that see that I've become more nuanced in my beliefs. And then there are people who are like very left wing that are like, oh, no, she's still a Nazi. Like she still has criticisms of you still get those immigration. Cards. She still has criticisms of this or that. And I'll tell you right now, anyone who comes out and is like, I was a right winger and now I regret it. And I am here to expose what horrible bigots they are. There's no honesty in that. People don't change their views 100%, especially when you've been in a political movement, left wing or right wing. There are a lot of deeply honest people that really believe they're trying to change the world for the right in both of those movements. And when you get to know them, you become friends with them. You lo love some of these people, yeah, of you know, with with your heart or your family, you know, your all of those things. You it's hard to let go of seeing things from their perspective and seeing the parts where they are right. 
Mm-hmm. And so anyone who like changes their belief overnight and is like, actually, all criticisms of immigration is just racism. No, you're just saying that because you want to make a quick buck. You're just saying that because you think you can pull the wool over people's heads and you don't actually have any core beliefs to you. So, you know, I've definitely in my travels, exploring the world, meeting people, I understand the nuance and complexity of things better. And that's just growing up. Yeah. The, the way the Internet acts like... You made a video in 2016 that you had this opinion and it wasn't nuanced and that's who you are for the rest of your life. Like (laughs) the moron in this situation isn't the person who grows up and, you know, creates nuance in their beliefs a bit. It's Mm. the person who thinks that growing up doesn't exist. It's like an example, maybe. (laughs) I I love that, by the way. Would an example of that maybe be if somebody sees, if they Google Lauren Southern and they see a t-shirt that you're wearing that's, it's okay to be white. Does that potentially leave somebody with an impression that isn't actually you? It's funny, I went and I uh, I was speaking to a university class and there was a kid at the back of the class that like put up their hand and they were like, you know, why did you wear this racist shirt? And I was like, okay, um, why do you think that shirt's racist? They're like, well, this article says it's a racist shirt. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, what do you think of the statement? It's okay to be white. Mm-hmm. And they're like, um, yeah, I'm like, do you think it's okay to be white? And they're like, yeah. Like, yeah, I think we both do. (laughs) And, you know, I understand when it's like portrayed in that. I I get what people are saying. They're like, well, it means more than just the statement itself. Like Mm. you're you're dog whistling or whatever. Like Black Lives Matter means more than just Black Lives Matter. It's tied to a whole social and political movement. I get that. But also like you're not going to. And maybe if we have a more nuanced conversation and you really convince me that it's okay to be white is like a deeply, you know, Nazi type statement. I think you're going to have trouble convincing me of that because I was part of the people that kind of popularized it at the time. And I know Mm. my intention was just, I think the media will freak out if I say this because they're kind of racist. So when you've been a part of popularizing that and you know what your intentions were, it's going to be hard to convince me that there were like other negative secret codes behind it (laughs) but yeah that seems to be a a mainstream media almost approach of well you're saying this and therefore you're inciting violence we hear a lot of that now by like oh it's one phrase is inciting somebody else and then you'll have interviews with the people who say a certain phrase or maybe wear a shirt or whatever it's i'm not inciting violence it's just is this statement in its own not okay like you've just explained and then response oh but somebody might take offense to that is this like what's happened to the media? Is the media just looking for any reason for somebody to be upset to run a story? Or have people become more sensitive? What's going on? Well, I think when when I was younger, when I was younger, I talk like I'm 60 sometimes. Yeah, let's be clear. I feel you're, like you're definitely, I am. I'm 28. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel it. I feel yeah. older than 28. <laughs> but um, no, when I was like 20 and really getting into this, um, the media, have you ever watched the movie Best of Enemies? Oh, no such a good movie it's uh gore vidal versus william f buckley who started the national review and then gore vidal very progressive wrote a bunch of you know progressive kind of lgbt books everything um they they were looking to spice up abc news Uh at the time who was falling behind in third or fourth or something and so it was like the election i think it was barry goldwater or something i can't remember the exact election that was going on but they decided what if we did like a debate show between gore vidal and william f buckley completely mm-hmm. different opinions and like just got them firing at each other that would be fascinating and this was where kind of the debate tv and youtube sphere blood sports kind of all sparked from right and it did very well it like totally boosted their ratings and it's one of the most fascinating movies to watch there's this one scene where I really feel it was like the dam breaking in the respect in media and society where Gore Vidal looks at William F. Buckley and says, you're a crypto fascist. And that was like, you know, shots fired. And Buckley (laughs) snapped too. And, um, oh, what did he say? He he said something about him being a goddamn queer. (laughs) And everyone was like shocked. You didn't do these things on like respectable TV at the time, right? And if you went back and uh, towards the end of the movie, uh, spoiler alert, you can skip past this if you plan on watching Best of Enemies, but they, towards the end of Buckley's life, they replayed that clip in one of his last interviews of him saying, like, you're a goddamn queer to Gore Vidal. 
and he almost cried. He looked like a broken man. Like he couldn't believe he allowed himself to get to that state. But that kind of behavior now is just the norm in media, right? This wow. name calling, this absolutely visceral straw manning of other people and what their beliefs are and what their core intentions are. And back then for someone like Buckley to do that, for someone like Vidal to do that, that was like, wow, what have I done not only to the sphere around me, but what have I done to my own soul to like portray people in that way? Mm and so dishonestly and now it's just the norm like the floodgates have broken and people see the opportunism that it created for abc wow. news at that time sure. and others and and everyone it's like oh i you push it just a little further push it just a little further and, uh, but it's always icarus flying too close mm -hmm. to the sun right eventually mm -hmm. you go too far and it destroys the whole thing and I've, I've partaken in that. I've mm -hmm. said things that I look at and I'm like, I did not need to say that about that person. I did mm -hmm. not portray them. I did not steel man them. I did not really try to understand them. And in turn, I've had many people do it to me. And it's a vicious cycle. And I almost can't even be mad because oh. I understand they wanted to create a villain because that's what people love to see. And I was just the blonde, cute villain that they could create at the time. Very interesting. You know, a 20 year old blonde Canadian girl that's a Nazi going around the world trying to shoot flare guns at immigrants. That's a fun story. And it's a lot more fun than a girl who's just trying to learn her steps in the political world and has watched too much Fox News and wow. really actually does have a lot of concerns about immigration because she grew up in Vancouver, which is a majority Chinese city now and has changed so much much when I was a kid. Tell us about that. You're you know? <laughs> what's, what's going on? Like, what's motivating you now? Because I, I sense the, the, not only the, the frustration, but almost some regret uh, in, in um, the trajectory of the impressions of people. It's not human. None of it's human. None of it's real. People aren't what they are on the internet. They aren't even what they portray themselves as on the internet. I, hmm. I was having this conversation with a friend recently. They're like, man, like you get all these like DMs and messages from people that just like adore you. That must be crazy. And I'm like, you know, it's appreciated, obviously. Like I work hard on some of the stuff I do and I appreciate it, but also they don't adore me. They don't know who I am. <laughs> like mm. They know the image of me and the work I've done and everything, but they don't know who I am. The only people you know are people you've spoken to face to face. And, mm. you know, I recently went to a conference, America Fest or whatever. It was a TPUSA thing. And I, uh, <laughs> I walked in and I'm not going to lie. I like immediately was like, okay, it's time to leave. After oh. walking into the conference, I like looked at all these faces and there was the like profile pictures that I had seen on X or Twitter and uh, YouTube. And I was like, these things need to remain on my screen, not in real life. Oh, wow. But <laughs> like, I, I don't like the collision of worlds. Too intense or what was it? Well, it's... There's something very disappointing, you know, seeing people that are entirely willing to be very dehumanizing and cruel on the internet or treat you in an entirely different way. And then you meet them face to face and all of that disappears. There's something that creates hope in humanity because, you know, you get these two people in a room together and you get rid of the it's the ego. It's the fact that people are watching on these websites. Mm -hmm. Right. It's I can't lose in this game of ego. But you put two people alone. You get rid of all the viewers, everything, it's gone. There's no need to perform and they're a completely different person. And there's something very emotionally kind of disturbing. It's like, wow, we really are just like a bunch of monkeys on a stage just trying to... Have you lost hope? Well, th this is the other thing I was going to say is there, there's something inspiring about it because you remember at the end of the day when humans get rid of that ego and when they get rid of... The, the people watching, there is a core of good in them. And, and they're actually quite meek creatures that are feeling very lost and just want to understand. And they see everyone else putting up an ego and everyone else putting up the show. And yeah. they're like, well, I guess I have to, too. And I don't really want to be hurt. And that person right now is getting canceled online in the Coliseum and ripped apart by the digital lions. And I don't really want that to be me. So I'm going to put up this personality. Mm. But then you see people face to face. You talk to them. You know, there's always that quote of, I like the 3 a.m. version of people, you know, the version where it's like really raw. And that exists in all of these people. Yeah, that exists that. in everyone. The worst person you know online has that 3 a.m. vulnerable version of themselves that I'm not saying it excuses their terrible behavior, but it exists. And I, I do believe it can be reached. And I think every person has that part of them that can so be reached. You're saying everybody, like, but you want that 3 a.m. to. I do. I want everybody to be like that all the time. I okay. think that's that's when we're raw and honest and get rid of the ego, that's when people can truly begin to love and understand one another. Um, but I guess the depressing part is you go there and it's like the internet is not getting smaller. 
it's expanding mm. and our connection to it our screen time and i'm part of it i'm part of that cycle like i am forever trapped in this internet world yeah. i i this is my lifeline now and i think that's bad i think the world where this wasn't people's jobs when i was younger was much better because um when people are now trapped to it and they don't have the ability to walk away or be canceled or just say something and then it doesn't work out and it's like well it's okay i still have my real life um you could actually just be honest you could just you didn't have to kind of create all these fake characters that yeah. everyone's talking to online but um yeah as it expands more and more people are going to be pressed to create their avatars on the internet that are just like the super ego it's we in, in regular want people to see basically yeah well in regular life like we all have a bit of a mask that we put on when we go out in our community trying to look good but on the internet you can just like really pump that shit up right <laughs> <laughs> like not only am i wearing a mask i'm literally wearing a mask i've got a filter going this isn't even me this is like an ai person that i've invented and i'm not even going to live as myself i'm going to spend 18 hours on my computer pretending to be you know an ai girl that's 15 years old or whatever like it's just it's getting weird out there right so how does this affect <laughs> everyday people uh like is it is it is it something where uh it's important to spend less time on say TikTok or social or is how how can an everyday watcher learn <laughs> from the pain that you're sharing? It's contradictory because I'm sitting here a hypocrite making the internet content literally right now. I'm trapping you on a screen, but at least I'm trying to say things that I think are honest. Mm -hmm. I think we all know we need to spend less time on the screens. I think we mm -hmm. all know that. I don't think there's any argument to be made there, but we're trapping people in false versions of reality. Um, and whether it be your political beliefs, we always create kind of hyped up, pumped up versions that are more exaggerated than what actually may need to be applied because that is far more, you know, interesting and encapsulating. And if you've just come back from a, an emotional argument with a family member at Thanksgiving where like your liberal cousin or conservative cousin has said something that like really pissed you off and you're angry at them, you know. Uh, someone on the internet telling you that they're literally a hell spawn demon that's going to have their life destroyed by degeneracy or have their life destroyed because they're not going to get the vaccine and COVID's going to kill them or whatever because they're a stupid conservative. You know, that's unfortunately the content that wow. feeds the ego, right? And it's, it's, a false version and that's of how you reality. create sort of the amplifying self echo chambers yeah is the idea yeah. well and and we look at it with you know both the discourse with men and women everyone's like why is the discourse with men and women gotten so weird well there's a lot of money in telling people there's nothing wrong with you it's everyone else's fault and whether it be like the feminists who are like it's all men are trash and all men are evil queen you've done nothing wrong like that want to hear that because they're really hurting inside and the idea that they could be at fault for you know the position they're in in life is really hard for so people to I accept clarify but then that. the men also have their own version it's all these yeah. whores trying to steal your money and you're doing nothing wrong king like they're just shallow you know barely humans it's like they just want that feedback loop and the content creators making that content get a lot of money from giving so them the, that feedback the idea loop. i've always been told this quote if if i point the finger three fingers point back at me that i am more to blame than mm -hmm. what i'm pointing at uh, are, are you suggesting that maybe some of the issues that men complain about with I can't find a good woman or women complain about I can't find a good man maybe has more to do with themselves than it does the other people? Is, is that what you're suggesting? I mean, we can only control ourselves in these scenarios. So if you're finding yourself repeatedly in a position where every single one of your relationships is not working out, I'm not saying that we don't live in a broken world where people don't have issues, but... You're the common denominator there. Just to think, to, to think you have nothing that you can change is delusional. You know, I've been through some tough situations with relationships. I've been through a divorce, and you know, I, I think I may have the compulsion, actually, the other way around, to blame myself too much sometimes because it wasn't until like a judge told me like your relationship was effed, <laughs> and like you wow. know, like this is messed up, and like you gotta like get away. Did I accept that? okay, maybe actually I, I do need to just accept. But but then that still in that it's like, okay, what is messed up in me that made me make this decision and not realize what was going on around me? <laughs> you know? and, and you're saying <laughs> social media folks might be trying to accelerate the self-delusion and then profit off of it. 
Whereas, like, clearly you went through something very extreme here. I mean, you were married to a federal agent? And this, there are two things here. Yeah, two I don't want to get into to too much into. details yeah, because yeah, but, I think we can talk about these things in a general sense. And, yes. you know, it's... Hmm. I'm still processing some of that, you know? <laughs> but yeah, they, that was one okay. of their jobs, but it wasn't entirely Okay, okay. All we'll we'll walk definitely from that. The, so, it was a big factor in like the very different lives going on yeah. and the contradiction. You know, like when you've got a security clearance and when you're someone who can destroy someone's security clearance, there's some pretty fundamental issues there. But okay. both of us decided to be in that relationship. So, so, so. We'll walk off that on then the media. Uh, do, you, do you think that's a thing? Is, is this... I mean, it's what you're implying is that social media influencers are going to pry on it's not you, it's everyone else, and then accelerating that echo chamber for profit. Is is that your argument? Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go into conservative circles, for example, and I just, you know, a lot of people in the conservative sphere, they kind of sometimes will refer to me as a traitor. I think the reasonable people are like... In the conservative sphere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reasonable people are like, okay, I completely understand what you're doing. But because I understand the conservative world better, because I grew up in that, I, I spent a lot of time in that sphere. I don't consider myself or call myself a conservative, but mm -hmm. I'm definitely in the dissident media for sure. And I have a lot of love for those people. A lot of those people are my family, my friends, you know, a lot of the politics the I very much agree with conservative okay, yeah okay. Not, not the dissident I have a lot media. of love <laughs> okay. and, and a lot of love for the dissident media too okay but um i just don't want to call myself that and then have people be like okay well this thing or that thing you did isn't conservative i'm i just rather be like okay fine like don't call me that that's okay, okay. if you guys want a very strict label i think that's okay you protect that right but um I critique it a lot because I understand it better. Like maybe if I was in left-wing politics for a long time, I could do a lot more internal critique of that. And I already have done a lot of outward critique, but I'll do a lot of internal critique because I think the best thing you can do is look inward and try to fix the things that you are doing and putting out into the world. And there's some frustration often within that audience. They're like, well, you're, you're a traitor, right? And it's like, no, love comes with honesty. Like if you are constantly, like let's say you're you're married and your partner is going out, they've got food in their teeth, you know, they smell bad, everything. Like, well, I got to constantly affirm them. I got, you look amazing. Mm. You're doing great, sweetie. Like perfect. And they go to the job interview, they don't get it. The person's disgusted by them. Well, do you, do you really help them by not pointing out the like, lettuce like let's, or whatever. let's fix some things here. Yeah. Let's like, but there's such a compulsion um, to not self-critique when you get in these groups because that means making your allies uncomfortable sometimes yeah. and the group dynamic is not always going to like that <laughs> and it's and the left has problems with it the right has problems with it everyone does genders have problems with it and within the you know the media sphere for conservatives just as once again an example like if you go into your and i maybe you you probably have the same thing your background of your like youtube statistics 90% of the audience of these videos, politics in general, is going to be male. Like wow. 90% for most of these channels. Even, not for you? Yeah, for me, for everyone. Wow. 80 to 90% for most creators that are in the political right-wing sphere. And that's just, you know, people can make whatever analysis they want of that. But I'm just saying, like a video saying, all right, men, let's look inward and consider how women might be correct in these positions. <laughs> That's just not going to do well. It's yep. just not going to do well, right? <laughs> yeah. So you get this feedback loop. And then, you know, vice versa, Jezebel magazine, whatever it is, they're going to have like an 80 to 90% female audience and doing a video saying, well, actually, you know, here's where men might be correct and where you might be being over emotional and misinterpreting them. That's not going to do well people right. are going to be like i don't want to read that sure. and <laughs> that feedback loop of like okay you've gone through a horrible breakup or had this situation of let's look up the specific situation i'm in on google and why i'm right everyone does that to make themselves feel better mm -hmm. because they already feel so attacked they already feel so in pain they just want something to soothe them to mm -hmm. make it feel like i did the right thing it's not me and the internet has every possible flavor of it's not you. <laughs> so you talk a lot about self-reflection on a personal level, on a political level, on a social level. But so what about an economic level? What about a lot of those people who right now are not in a good place financially? Because I know a lot of your content covers like 
mm-hmm. how much chaos the world's in and how like what a hard time it is to be alive right now. Mm-hmm. How much that do you think is based on luck and how much do you think is like, again, the common denominator being the person in the bad financial situation? See, that is a very good question because we were talking about this earlier just for my own um, episode with you and about your kind of positive vision for how you approach trying to build up your wealth. And I'm like, okay, well, here's all of the negatives that are facing young people. The reason I tend to focus more on being sympathetic to people that are economically struggling is once again, because of the background I come from. I come from a sphere where it is very hardcore swung on the pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like if you are poor, it's your fault. Like that's Mm -hmm. kind of the background I come from. And I do think that has helped people like get their butt up and just be like, I don't care how hard this situation is. I'm going to make it work no matter what. And that's helped me in my own life. Within the past four years, I had like nothing in my bank account. You know, (laughs) I was like, no idea what I'm going to do or where I'm going to go. And I was able to build back and get my life back together. And part of that comes from the way I was raised, the attitude that was imprinted on me. But also... Good for you, by the way. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of myself, actually, for that one. Um, But also, I know that there is... The the self-reflection there is actually me saying, okay, but is there something I can understand from people who are in that hard position? Can I, like, try to put myself in their shoes Mm -hmm. from this perspective I come from and say what are the challenges that could seem insurmountable to them? How can we sympathize while still encouraging people to work hard and try to pull themselves out? And and that's more of the self-reflection because of my background. So Mm -hmm. one person's self-reflection is going to look very different from another's depending on where their baseline is. (laughs) Now, your uh, criticism that echoes a lot in, in your postings now is immigration. Can, can you touch on what's going on in Canada? What's the immigration crisis that Canada is facing? Yeah. Um, I, I think I've, it's so hard to talk about immigration because I'm a little more self-aware of what other people are interpreting when I say immigration. Like okay. They're like, oh, yeah, you just hate brown people. You just hate people that are different than you. And it's not there are so many factors that have absolutely nothing to do with that. You're becoming, <laughs> that, you're becoming a lot more careful. Well, it's not even about being careful. I'm just like, I actually want people to understand what I'm saying. Your point. Okay. I, I actually just want you to understand. Like, I just okay. don't want... I, I used to not care that much when I was younger, when mm-hmm. people didn't understand what I was saying, because I almost found it entertaining. I'm like, look how mad they are. Look how wrong <laughs> they are. Like, they don't even know what I'm saying. Like, okay. you're just an idiot. <laughs> and in reality, when everyone or when lots of people are misunderstanding you, you kind of need to sit there and be like, okay, how can I explain this better? Okay. That's another okay. self-reflection. <laughs> yeah, point. that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> But um, fundamentally, humans that are very similar to you, that have grown up in the same environment as you, they speak the same language, they have the same cultural you know, icons that they look to. If you were to talk about your childhood, you could talk about the same place you got ice cream from as a kid. You have all of these similar reference points. Those people that have 100,000 points of reference together that are similar, obviously you can understand each other better because the reference points, but they have a hard enough time as it is loving one another, being kind to one another, being good and and not misinterpreting one another. You look at marriages, even within communities that are very similar, similar values, similar morals, they still fall apart. People still go crazy. People still rob and murder each other and treat each other horribly. Um, We really are being naive when we think we can just mesh a bunch of people with a thousand billion different reference points and very few points of common um, reference together and not have problems and and not have total, you know, disconnect. We're talking like we have immigration here where people don't even speak the same language. You're talking like refugees, asylum. Well, no, no, no. Our like our immigration, just like the legal normal system. Everything. There's a joke within Australia that it's like, uh, what's what's the um, difference between someone who applied for immigration to? Uh, let me try to figure out how this works. No it's worries. Like, yeah, what's the thing in common to an immigrant in Australia and Canada that's from India? Oh, they both applied for Australia, but they have like, oh. <laughs> yeah, they have um, much higher rates of like your English proficiency for Australia. Oh, requirements. So like, oh. yeah, requirements. So okay. if you failed, well, you just apply for Canada next. Mm. So 
I think you're going to have a lot less problems with immigration in countries that have higher standards for, you no, know, you actually have to be able to be cohesive with the people in your community. You have mm. to be able to communicate with them. You have to be able to get a job and generally function integrate in and function in society. Yeah. We are lowering those standards all the time, in mm. part because immigration is being used as a tool to keep up the rich and elites Ponzi scheme of property here in Canada. Tell I, us about that. Yeah. that. That was a mouthful. Oh, tell <laughs> yeah. us about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the entire Canadian economy, we're like in a debt economy right now mm -hmm. where uh, everyone's money is just tied up in the housing market. And if that were to crash, everything would collapse. Sure. Right. And I think even uh, you'd agree with that. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Um, and so the kind of the mode of operation of our government right now is just keep the housing costs up at all co all costs, like no matter what. And that to keep means prices up. keep prices up the because assets. all of our like, yeah, if this crashes, the whole Ponzi scheme fails. And one of the ways to do that is mass immigration. If mm. you have too many people for the houses that exist, well, there's going to be a lot of people competing and increasing those prices, right? Yeah, Fighting demand, for them, simple. supply, demand. Yeah. It's very simple, yeah. you think, but <laughs> like the the liberal government, they pretend to be idiots. They but really they're building, walk around. Of course, right? They're building. <laughs> yeah, they build ten thousand houses in three years in a town, London, Ontario, where they're inviting thirty thousand people every year. You know, <laughs> whatever it is, yeah. the rates are just completely the number. The math is not mathing yeah. in this. You know, we're talking five hundred thousand. It's out of that. Immigrants a year, and that's not even including like student visas, you know, all the illegal immigration to 200,000 houses being built every yeah. year. And that's up substantially, the 500K number as well. Yeah, yeah, it's going up every year. And it's that's in a country where we already don't have enough houses for the people living in it. So that's just necessarily going to keep those housing prices up, 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 no matter what. And it's getting to a point where. It's almost like they're expecting the people in Canada to just lower their standard of living to the people that they're inviting into the country. Mm. So someone who has come from a very poor country and, you know, I, I get it. I understand. I do the same thing that they're doing. There's oh, no hate there. Yeah. Right. It's just a hatred for what the government plan is for the people that are like my family and friends in my community. Mm -hmm. They want us all to be OK with living 20 to 40 people to a house, you know, all pooling in our resources from our minimum wage jobs to pay for that, like the people that they're shipping in who are doing that right now. Mm. We all know it. You can go look at all the videos of basically slumlord complexes in Toronto and Vancouver for Indian immigrants and students that they've created, which is disgusting. And they just want us all to lower our standard of living to living like that. And then when we were talking earlier about wages and competing for lower wages, this is big corporations that love the fact that, oh, OK, local Canadians don't want to work this backbreaking job yeah. for minimum wage like every day, horrible pay, no benefits. That's OK. We'll invite someone in. instead of instead of adjusting our wages to what the people here will work for so right. that there's like an equitable trade of you know, the corporation investing in the population and the population investing in the business. No, we'll just ship someone in from overseas who has a lower standard of living and lower standards for what their wages are. And then ca Canadians, you're just not going to get a job if you don't lower your standards. Wow. And it's just absolute corporate political takeover of the population. The politicians, you can look at it. They've all got their investment por for portfolios, property all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. They want to keep these numbers up for themselves and their families. And then the corporations are making tons of money off of driving down wages with mass immigration. And then you have the delusional kind of liberal left-wing commentator class that are like, you're a racist if you criticize this. Love the working class. And they, I, I, I don't know if it's delusion or if it's because they're employed by the same very politicians and media corporate complex that are doing this. And they've just kind of fallen into line with lying to the populace and destroying your reputation if you criticize what's going on. But that's what it feels like. Or maybe they are just that delusional. I don't know. It could be a toss up, right? <laughs> so is there a, a level of immigration that's OK uh, uh, that you think of? Or is it systems or what fixes the immigration problem? Is it just no immigration? Or what uh, is no, it? I think there is a level of immigration that is fine. We've had mm. normal levels in the past that were sustainable where our infrastructure was keeping up. And that's another thing that oh. the immigration people never talk about. They say, well, why don't we just build more houses? Sure. Okay, well, let's deal with, you know, the problem we have now. We got to build the houses first. Like, let's stop, you know, close the floodgates and catch up. Like, you can't just build these things overnight. No. But even so, 
okay, we build a ton of houses. The neighborhood I grew up in when I was younger, Langley, BC, some people, you know, you can drive down the roads there. It, it's completely different. It's It actually like hurts my soul when I drive through there because it's just townhouse central. It's starting mm. to look like... Been developed, you know, to clarify. You're yeah, about yeah, it's developed. It, it like developed. looks nice, but... It used to be trees. It used to be parks. And it's just like housing, 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 housing. Like you can't see anywhere, Urban right? Sprawl. Urban sprawl. Urban yeah. sprawl. And people don't realize that when you do that, there's a lot more infrastructure as well. Like let's use our brains. For school okay. fire. Hospitals. Yeah. Are our hospitals keeping up? We know damn well our hospitals are not keeping up. The mm. waiting times have gone way through the roof. People are dying waiting for their treatments. Yeah. The infrastructure is not keeping up. The roads, uh, Highway 1, anyone, you know, driving from Vancouver to Langley to Abbotsford, it's like getting impossible. Mm. You're sitting in traffic all day long. You, you can only, great, build tons of houses. Okay, hospitals, schools. Yeah. You know, walking trails, uh, going to the beach anymore and not even being able to find somewhere to sit. Like the quality of life is dropping drastically as well when you don't have this infrastructure in place, mm. which we don't. So it's quite obvious that it's just this Ponzi scheme of keep that housing price up, don't care how it's affecting people. And that's not even mentioning the social aspect that I was explaining at the be beginning of this, where it's like we are having communities just quarantine themselves into tiny little micro cities and countries of their own ethnic group that speak the same language, whether it be, you know, the Crystal Mall area or Richmond, I'd take you there and drive you through if you had more time. But even the signs advertising property are all in Chinese there. Wait, They're not tell even me in about English. This. I want to know about this area. Well, this is oh, it's, it's like all Chinese. Everyone that lives there is and Chinese how far away and is speaks this? Chinese. Uh, I mean, okay. if you're, it's like 20 minutes, it's near the airport, YVR. Okay. okay. Anyways, um, yeah, that area, it's pretty close. You can just drive in and about there. Or the Guru Nanak Temple area in Surrey, which is 80 to 90% ethnically Indian. And, you know, people aren't speaking English there. You've got the Khalistan problems or uh, you've got Koreatown areas. And then you've got little like white enclaves as well. And everyone's, it's actually creating the opposite of this multicultural kumbaya state that people said we could achieve we were closer to that to that in the 90s when you had people of different ethnic groups yeah. that had the same kind of interests hobbies were talking to each other were growing up in the same communities and like when you were younger you know when i was younger like when you were hanging out with someone who was of a different ethnicity they had generally they had so much in common with you yeah, because they were just another kid whose yeah. parents grew up here and they're like yeah you so have all changed? the same. Well, now it's like an immigrant from an immigrant town where everyone speaks their own language and they don't really trust outsiders from that area. And even like down to like the gangs, our gangs are turning into ethnic gangs that are fighting each other in mm. ethnic conflicts. It's like <laughs> uh, it, there. It's hard for people to assimilate. Yeah. If I were to move to another country, I don't think I could assimilate to all their values, language, and customs in my lifetime. It would probably be oh, my wow. children and their children, maybe their children, my children's children that could do that, right? Yeah. It takes a long time. People don't change overnight. Yeah. Even when you get married to someone from another culture, people, marriages break up over that. Like it takes a long, even when you love this person and you want to be a part of it. And we're not even necessarily talking about people who love and want to be part of Canada. So for a lot of people, it's just an economic opportunity like i want to take everything i can get from this place and send it back home to my family well of course i mean if you come from syria or turkey or venezuela or, or, or whatever yeah, I mean, or a lot of refugees they don't even want to be here they'd rather be home but unfortunately the west destabilized their countries yeah. with their horrible mm. foreign policy and i don't blame them for that but let's mm. not lose sight of the reality that this whole ethnic kumbaya religious kumbaya all of these things uh, it, it there's very real community conflict that occurs. We see how that. How did the West destabilize in your opinion? Oh, I think, you know, foreign wars that shouldn't mm. have taken place in a lot of countries, you know. Um, there's an amazing video of the French, or is it Italian? What, what's the Italian president's name? I, oh, I the have lady. it on the tip uh, of my tongue. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, she loves Elon Melanie, Musk. Melanie, Melanie, yeah. is it? I, he's I, been yeah, visiting her. Guys, but, um, the name. She we loves got... Elon. <laughs> Her, her. The, what is her name? It's gonna kill okay, me. I can see her face. We'll find out. We need uh. to know. We must know. Uh, and and as I pull that up, of course, this is the first thing I see on my <laughs> yeah, phone. Yeah, of it's, course, of course. Yeah, this is it's what gonna... people wear in Canada, right? And... Oh yeah, that's yes. what we all all wear. Everybody. I hate it. Thank yeah. you. I already you know, my I country. Years. My country is sad enough. <laughs> 
Thank you, Kevin. I thought all your heads were going to be like split. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That's us. <laughs> there it is. Maloney. Yeah. Georgia, Georgia Maloney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a video of her speaking about... Um, <laughs> I need to just find the video. Yeah. But where she's talking about uh, like economic meddling in Africa from Fr France, like basically taking all their resources, mm -hmm. giving them essentially pennies to the dollar for what they're getting and, and talking about. It's on all levels. It's not mm -hmm. only wars. It's economic meddling. It's going in and... Um, <laughs> You're like, explain your foreign policy problems with the West. Okay, let me go back to university here and write an essay for you. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to have it on the tip of my tongue. That's okay. I'm, I'm like, sorry. oh my gosh, this is just a given. Now I'm being asked for details. I'm sorry, I'm retarded. <laughs> it's okay. Do you think was, someone... Let's, but no, let's I, do, I do think I will... I will stand on the talking point that if you gave me time to sit down yes. and write an essay about all of the foreign meddling in other countries, I 1000% would be confident with the time Let's to research I can get you specific How about <laughs> examples. Somebody like Vivek or Trump, who would be more likely to, to, in your opinion in America, maybe solve that foreign meddling? And, you know, Vivek has this idea that let's let's just freeze the boundaries in ukraine stop spending money in uh, uh you know to to israel for invading the gaza strip where do you stand on some of these things and and the the idea of uh someone like vivek being able to solve all of america's problems you know i guess it comes down to uh, i i want to stress the fact that I don't think the destabilization and the reasons people are leaving their home countries are all entirely their own fault. Some of them are, you mm. know, some of them are, you know, you got a lot to get together in your own country and your own customs are kind of messed up and some of you are trying to escape them because you don't agree with them. Mm. Um, but then I'd also stress the fact when it comes to foreign policy, I look at <laughs> on a smaller scale, our own internal foreign policy like just policies from our federal government towards small communities and how detached they are like do you think that someone who's living in your own community you know a thousand people around you is going to have a better idea of the problems that need to be solved in your neighborhood than a politician on the other side of your country right. everyone's going to say it's going to be the person in their community of course. and I, when i it's almost like telling in itself that you're asking me, like, give me these examples of foreign policy. I don't understand it well enough. And I don't even think our politicians do. Half Probably the stuff not. that they're voting on, uh, you, you saw Vivek talk to um, when he started asking, what's her face? Nikki to, Haley. Nikki Haley to uh, name three, you know, just three cities in Ukraine, in the three East regions Ukraine. in Ukraine. Like and she couldn't. Dnipro, Donetsk or whatever. She didn't mention but a single one. But it's not one. just yeah, Nikki Haley. It's yeah. most of us just mm -hmm. don't understand this foreign policy stuff enough to be meddling in it to such great degrees, pumping so much money into mm -hmm. it, sending troops there. And I don't think I'm any sort of expert on these things, but I do know that on a local level, you just have a lot more capacity to actually understand and live the issues yourself and so what are the solutions and become? create solutions because yeah. you've lived them. so so really what you need is you need it sounds like would you agree with economic success where you have economic growth and then building out like slowly expanding existing communities or or how do you add more housing if that then does take the trees away and you have townhomes right so like where's the balance <laughs> well i think it's it's this Definite, like too much expansion and globalization all at once for a population who all of this is very new to. I mean, too rapid of a change. It, it's far, it's far too rapid oh, of a change. Okay. You look mm -hmm. at just technology, and we all are like. Once again, it's one of those undeniable things where researchers are like, oh, wow, we're starting to study and find that screen time causes depression. <laughs> There's yeah. lots of shocking results. It's like, well, yeah, this is like a, a, a new thing in all of human history. Like we're, we're learning. We're just learning to live with just learning some of the new technology of the computer and now we've got the iPad and now we've got the AI and now we've got the, oh my gosh, what's coming next? We're just not adjusting fast enough. And you can even see it on Facebook when you look at boomers interacting with like TikTok videos that are quite clearly AI and they're like, oh my gosh, there's an alien in uh. California right now <laughs> or look at that train crash and it's all fake. And I see these thousands of comments and likes and shares and I'm like, holy, the human mind has not adjusted to technology to today. this technology yet in a way that we can responsibly use it and i think that goes for our immigration rates right now yeah. as well uh, we can humans i think we have very similar core programming um i, I think there's divinity and goodness in all mm -hmm. of us 
but I also think there are very, very large differences between people groups, even people groups that are the same ethnicity if you come from different sure. areas, like to pretend, oh, Croatians and Serbians, they're both white. They're, they'd be besties, right? Are you like delusional? <laughs> you know, like there's like such a ethnocultural like difference in history there that needs to be unpacked and understood and communication that needs mm -hmm. to occur to such a deep level and to just throw a bunch of people in the span of 10 years into a community with extremely different values and expect wow. that everything's going to be kumbaya delusional insane and people don't want mm. to accept this they they like the easy safe cutesy answer of we're all just gonna get along. have a great time mm. and get along but that's not reality and that's actually setting people up for failure and that's setting people up for more racism i reckon we are oh. going to be far more racist 20 years from now than we are now like i was saying with we're seeing the ethnic divides yeah. because immigration oh, so is happening racism at such will get worse for sure you know it's so interesting because in europe uh angela merkel pushed for accepting as many Syrian refugees as possible. I think the count is now over 2 million Syrian refugees in a country that is roughly the population of Canada. Uh, what's remarkable is this migration has now really promoted the popularity of the uh, Alternative mm -hmm. for Deutschland, the Afghan. Well, the far right parties are winning all across Europe because exactly. of immigration. And this is exactly what I'm saying. It's like, actually, if you are liberal and you want there to be kumbaya, like ethnicity is all getting along, then you want the slowest immigration possible at a rate that is going to make people assimilate and learn each other's it's languages. As... It's the rate of change that matters. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, you know. It also like the ethnic enclaves that I grew up with here in Canada. And once again, this is probably why immigration became such an issue to me at such a young age. Was you I lived with. in, I grew up watching this. Okay. Um, we're one of the most, we are, I think, the most Asian city outside of Asia here in, um, you know, Vancouver. And, you know, you, there, there are much worse immigration cultures <laughs> that you could deal with than... You mean it, in terms of clash? Like in terms of clash, okay, for okay, sure. Yeah, but there yeah. still is clash there. And it hap when it's happening at such a great rate, um, there's no longer an incentive to actually assimilate or communicate to anyone outside your in-group. Oh, wow. Okay, why would I go and I join Canadian culture and learn English when I can just go and slot right in here where it's easy and everyone already speaks the same language as me and I've already got my cousins and brothers and everyone and people that have the same cultural reference points as me. And that's what I'm talking about with cultural reference points. It's very hard to create new ones and to like start to simil become similar in them uh, and to the point that people just won't if they don't have to. So what you're going to see is countries forming within countries and then splitting off. Where it's going to be like the mm. Balkans, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's I'm from the Balkans. It's a terrifying thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you've been very critical of, of immigration, at least current immigration policy. Uh, another thing on the Internet, at least, that people hold you really critical of is uh, Islam to the point that a lot of people will say that you're an Islamophobe. So would you say that that's something where like, do you are you critical of Islam because, as you said earlier, it's a taboo and it's something that you can't be critical of. Do you not like the religion itself? Or would you say you're critical of all religions and people are picking on you for no reason? Um, I, I would say that it definitely when I was younger, it was like I saw a sacred cow of the media where I'm like, OK, I watch you guys criticize Christianity all the time. And I just simply do not see that same energy being brought to Islam. So it was very much a devil's advocate. OK, you're not going to talk about this. Well, I will. And I think this does definitely create a um, like I can see you looking at it from the outside and being like, well, all she does is this when in mm -hmm. my mind, I'm like, OK, well, I'm trying to balance out the mm -hmm. conversation. So when the Islam stuff became like there was way more of an outpouring of criticism from a ton of people, you can even see in my content. I kind of backed off. I'm like, OK, all of the criticism I've said, I've said. And there's a lot of people filling that blank. And I think even some of them are, you know, maybe not holding that same energy for other uh, religions or other bad ideas out there. Uh, but also it would feel silly for me to come out and be like, OK, well, here's the criticisms of Christianity I have when I would just be repeating like a thousand left wing academic think pieces, government thing. Like It's just so out there already. I just don't see the point of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are criticisms of aspects of Christianity that I would have. And I know I say that coming from a Christian background, but it's it's a very all encompassing religion with a lot of different people in it and a lot of different offshoots and sects of the faith. Right. But um, 
certainly at the time I was in media, it was like, yeah, Islam was that golden calf that you simply could not touch. Mm. And if if I had, but I look at it and I'm like, if I had grown up in a time where Christianity or something else, whatever it might be, you know, there was a golden calf out there that was completely different. Um, I probably would have been criticizing that instead. I probably would have had a very different political career because I just kind of have a compulsion to question power, certainly when I was younger. <laughs> w would you now almost hold back a little bit until maybe others are questioning a little bit first and then join the well, conversation? Okay, so you can see this in like... I came out as one of the big anti-feminist commentators in 2015, 2016. Anti-feminist. Anti-feminist. Anti -feminist. So bit, like yeah. I literally, you know, I, I, I'm I, not super proud of it, but I understand where I was coming from. But I would go to these protests and I'd like question feminist protesters that would like put tape on their boobs and be like, let's fight rape culture. I'm like, you know, what is this doing? What is running around naked, putting tape on your boobs, like realistically doing? And some of the points that I was making, I understand, but the way I was doing it, like, going into an environment where people are already in a super heightened state. They're not thinking super logically. They're not the academics. They're not going to be the smartest people that are able to like steel man and defend this ideology. If anything, it's possibly where I'm going to get the worst sampling of commentary and then blasting that on the internet for clicks. I do think I contributed to a very unhealthy political environment by doing this. But um, also it was at a time where feminism was the golden calf. No one could question it. You were a bigot. You were all hmm. of these things. If you had any ideas about, hey, do you think we could be taking this too far? Do you think there's like a side where there's some sympathy we can have for men and understanding for men here. And so I was trying to once again play that balancing act. But now I've seen a lot of this red pill content come out and it's like all women are whores trying to steal your resources. <laughs> and I've done commentary on it where I'm like, this is delusional. You guys are just acting like feminists. You distrust all women. You're taking data and you're completely twisting it. This is like crazy, you know, like. It's, but are you holding <laughs> back on this? Um, I probably could talk on it more, but I feel like because I've just gone through a divorce yeah. myself, I'm like, okay, it's it's also personal to me. So I've like experienced firsthand some of the ideological stuff that I bought into on the internet, of whether it be ideas about what happens in divorce to men versus women or in relationships, who's at fault, who's more likely to leave. Like my personal experience was so different from what the right-wing conception of <laughs> relationships are that I realize it's also a bit personal to me. So without I'll getting make, personal I, takeaways. I, oh, but I, I just wanted yeah, to comment. Like yeah. I will comment when I feel I can just make like a very logical point where okay. I'm like, okay, this is just wrong. But I do try to hold back a bit because I understand that a lot of people's commentary is coming from a personal place. Right, and right, I'm right. like, it's it's not healthy. It's not necessarily a great thing to but use you know, the political debate sphere as your own personal outlet. <laughs> sure. Outlet. But, 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 I mean, okay. So a few things to unpackage here. Peter Schiff during the Occupy Wall Street movement had a viral video of I'm the one percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And confronted the Occupy Wall Street, uh, uh, you know, protesters. I respected that. And I kind of respect you for having just described what you did about what. So what are you protesting about? What has made you see that as bad? Well, hmm. When I, it's it's the way that people consume content as much as how it's made. And I know a lot about how content is made and I know a lot about how people consume it having spent 10 years doing this. And, you know, when I do a video talking to feminists that are screeching on the street, it's very entertaining to watch, right? Well. It's very funny. But then I find myself 10 years later watching a video about a guy going on the street and interviewing women like, oh, like, would you cheat on a guy or how much should a man earn? And every single answer is, I'm not going to date a man unless he's six two and earning mm -hmm. $5 million. And then the video concludes, you know, this is why women are gold digging whores. And then every single comment below is, this is why I don't date women, fuck women, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, like, I know you interviewed 
30 people right. and cut out every reasonable answer from Took that. Four. Yeah. I know the people watching this think this is representative of all women when mm -hmm. I don't know a single woman in real life who would give an answer like that. Yeah. You've gone onto the streets of Miami and found like the most, you know, uh, most materialistic Miami, <laughs> Miami <laughs> girls at 2 a.m. that Bell are Harbor. drunk. <laughs> and then you're presenting this as reality. And the people watching this are typically going to be internet addicts. So they're not actually engaging with the real world that much. And the more they watch this content, the less they they want to engage with the real world and they're getting trapped in a spiral of delusion like literal delusion but i think you're counterbalancing there, should, there needs to be more of lauren not uh, less <laughs> and then i'm but i'm human and i look at the things i've done and the mistakes i've made and i'm like but do i mistakes. am i the counterbalance can i be the counterbalance or will staring into the abyss just mm. uh you know have the abyss stare I, back into me i can't help but feel you sound a little defeated Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I, <laughs> I I think it's like I recognize that I've needed to go through this like twilight of the soul, this quieting of my life and introspecting and understanding everything I went through. I had a very strange life and I don't have a lot of people that I know that can relate with the life I had. You know, I was mm -hmm. one of the first political viral figures and then a lot of Everyone on the other side of politics thought I was like a literal monster, like Nazi trying to kill people. And then everyone on my side of politics, when I took a break and stepped away because of government or a lot of people on my side of politics, when I took a break and stepped away because of government intervention in my life, uh, there were a lot of people that slandered me and tried to wreck my reputation. And you know, threw me away. And now that I have some introspection about the things I've seen in life experience, you know, a lot of people are just too much in that cycle of mm -hmm. wanting the 100% affirmation for their own political yeah. ideas that I've come back and I feel a bit politically homeless. It's like, oh wow, my real life contradicts a lot of the ideas people have online that are really easily slotted into. And I could sit here and I could memorize every single talking point I would need to say and repeat it with as much enthusiasm as possible yeah. to go viral and have millions of views on my videos again, whatever. Like yeah. that's, I, I see the formula. I know what you have to do, but I don't have it in me because mm -hmm. I've experienced firsthand some of the consequences of actually truly believing in some of these ideologies, but not understanding the nuances and not yeah. understanding how the real life works and I would how real life works and I would not want to perpetuate that mm -hmm. more. Well, I, I think that it was very eloquently said. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. but that is, unfortunately, I think very common on social media now. It's that you might not truly believe something, but then you spout it, not you specifically, but somebody might spout it on Twitter, like uh, you know whatever conspiracy it might be. And then that is really popular because it echoes a, a feeling or a sentiment, but it completely misses sentiment or, or, or nuance rather. It misses all the nuance. But people make their livings off of that. And that seems to amplify uh, uh, hate rather than understanding. So it seems like the only way to counterbalance that is by trying more. But I don't know. Is it fruitless? No, no, no. I think. No, I, I wouldn't say give up. It's, hmm. It's interesting. It, it's like a balance of I want to, I, I, it's not so much I want to, I'm afraid of the internet and I'm afraid of being in politics and I'm defeated and all these things. It's that I actually have something I care about and I want to protect. And it's like, I care about being a real human. I care about not being consumed by these things. Mm -hmm. I care about my child. I care about my mm -hmm. family. I care about the real relationships I have. Mm -hmm. And I know all of us have the capacity to be consumed by the people we can become online and the worlds that we can entrench ourselves in and the politics and the battles. And I know very deep, like deeply, how 
easily people lose themselves to that world, how easily wow. people abandon and hurt friends for a little bit of money, for a little bit of power, how easily they forget about the people they love at home while they're traveling the world. And life passes them by and they find themselves addicted to drugs at the head of the political game and they don't even know who they are anymore. And I am more afraid of losing the journey I am having of rebuilding my soul and mm. the social connections I have and the people I love than I am afraid of politics. That's what I'm actually afraid of. Wow. Ugh, sorry. <laughs> wow. This is, yeah, this this is, uh, this is intense. Uh, you've gone through one hell of a roller coaster the last four years, not just with uh, the divorce that you've gone through, but with uh, rebuilding and, and, uh, uh, Gosh, I mean, even I couldn't just imagine what you've had to go through with just being tr able to try to travel to visit your family and then being banned from countries. I'm sorry. It's been pretty wacky. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I, I wouldn't take back a minute of it. Like I'm not, yeah. it's given me a lot of depth of soul to understand people that have been through some pretty crazy things. And it doesn't matter. Like I was talking to a friend of mine um, recently who their parents got divorced when we were younger, when we were kids. And I was like, I actually don't think until I went through all the pain in my life in my 20s that I could deeply sympathize and understand you to the level that I do now when we were kids. Like, I just couldn't be there for you in, in a way because I hadn't experienced that level of my world falling apart. And so it's like, it's actually, there's a lot of blessing and pain and there's a lot of things you can rebuild and a lot of strength that comes with it. So I don't, I don't you know, uh, I hate this to be seen as like, oh, woe is me, because it's really not. Like I have, at the end of the day, I feel like I won. I really do. I I have everything I could possibly want in my life Internal right now. contentment. Internal contentment. I'm yeah. happy with the journey I'm on. Yeah. I have everything I need to survive. I've rebuilt my life. I have an amazing community, amazing friends. I've got yeah, just amazing people in my life that are here right now. Like it's it's been so cool. And I still feel like I am going through that journey where I haven't decided, all right, well, this is just the person I have to be and these are the lines I have to say and this is like the life I have to live or I can't survive and I'm just going to drone on. Like, no, every day is a new battle to rebuild my soul and who I am and I still have the opportunity every day to, I'm going to take an entirely different course. I don't have to be Lauren Southern, right-wing commentator. Do I still find some of those ideas interesting and correct? Yeah. And guess what? If I think they're correct, I get to choose to say that. I didn't have to change my tune and say I'm a left winger now and I revolt against and cancel everyone I used to know. Because guess what? There are a lot of right wingers, far right wingers, people that would scare you guys that I love mm -hmm. and I think of beautiful souls. There are a lot of people that are far left that I love and think of beautiful souls mm. and they're um, people in the world are a lot more complicated than just what you see on the screen. Like way more complicated and way more interesting in real life and when you actually try to get to know them and see the good in them. <laughs> yeah, you, you're under no obligation to be the same person you were five minutes ago. I think that's something totally. really important that people miss. Well, that's what the internet gets wrong. It's yes. like you watch a video of me from 2016. Oh, that's Lauren. That's pff, that's like five seconds of my life. Are you crazy? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to ask a question that uh, on the episode that's going to be on, on your channel, mm -hmm. Kevin, you talked about asking all of your classmates, how many of you wake up every day mm. thinking today's going to be a better day than it was yesterday? What's your answer to that? And has that changed at, at, in the last five years? Hmm. I am much happier now than I, uh, than I was at the height of my political career, so to speak. I woke up with so much anxiety every day, so much anxiety about like getting on. And maybe you, people who have kind of been you know trending on the internet multiple times or whatever they mm -hmm. probably understand the feeling of like getting on a plane and not having connection and like literally sweating like what is going to be on twitter when i land oh and my gosh yeah 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 <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know it you know that feeling you're gonna be okay over there <laughs> um and i don't live with that anymore and that's very nice and yeah i do wake up thinking even if i'm not thinking this is going to be a better day i definitely think this there's an opportunity for this to be a better day. Yeah. And I think that's all you need is to know that there's the opportunity if you make the right move. Just keep trying to do the next right thing as, what is it, Elsa says? Ah. <laughs> all my movie references are, hmm? Anna, thank mm. you. Love you, girl. <laughs> <laughs>
Get all these Disney VHS tapes behind us too. Yeah, no, I've got a kid. So all I'm doing is watching kid movies. There's, I'm, I'm like, I watched Lilo and Stitch the other night and I like cried three one. times in it. With, <laughs> with, with your... With my son. We do different. like movie nights. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I love... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know. I love kid movies. I feel like rewatching them when you're older, it's like a whole different, you kind of see a whole mm. new message than what you saw when you were younger. It's not like the it's action good, yeah. scenes and everything. It's like the yeah. deeper message. Nani has a different personality when you're an adult, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful movie. You nailed the Tucker Carlson prediction. You predicted nine-ish months ago that Tucker would not go back to traditional media, that he would stay independent uh, or go independent mm -hmm. and uh, come up with some kind of uh, subscription model, mm -hmm. which is exactly what he did. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. That's mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel like that's been the course of most people that have left the mainstream media because i think a lot of people are realizing back in 2015 2016 the heyday of the political right when they were really like bouncing off they you could make a lot of money just doing a fundraiser or go fund me like i want to do a project like mm. just donate um but unfortunately because the political sphere really got inundated with scams you know we, we live in a scam economy almost every i'd say 75% of the calls I get are literally scam calls, right? Yeah, it's just people yeah. trying to, uh, the trust in our society has just been broken so right. much. Um, and unfortunately, the trust between, and I, I say unfortunately, but I'm honestly glad people woke up to it. The trust between the public and the political figures wanting to represent them has been very broken. So it's had to become business-like, you know, contracts, transactions, subscription, it, it's much less donations because mm -hmm. of all the scams, whether it be, we're going to build you a wall, we're going to start this company if you just donate, we're mm -hmm. going to start. Um, yeah, people don't, can't survive like that. Back in 2015, I think Tucker could have done like a totally free, no subscription service, just donate. But I, I've been, like, I've been watching these trends for a long time. So I'm like, okay, we're at this period mm. of the trust between the audience and the public. And Tucker's got enough people that want to see consistent, high quality content that it can become like a bit more of a Netflix thing. What happened to your show with him? You had a, you had a oh, yeah, video we, or a movie? We did or... a, we did a really fun production, took his team off, like off-roading and shooting out here and talked about the state of Canada. It was called Oh Canada and it was going to be about Trudeau and essentially America's need to invade Canada and save us. But um, I literally went to LA. I filmed a promotion episode with Tucker like a month before it was going to be released. It was awesome. All went up and then like, I feel like it was like a week later, Tucker got fired from Fox News and they just memory hold the whole documentary and it was done editing it was going to be oh. awesome which i think is such a shame and such a it speaks a lot to the decisions at fox news that it's like wow a lot of people put effort into this film a lot of people poured their hearts and souls out people in my community like took their time off you know just regular people that that's important to them they they've got regular jobs regular lives and they really went out of their way to make this work and the disrespect of being like, well, our petty thing with Tucker. I mean, maybe just a caveat, maybe there was something in the Dominion lawsuit or whatever that said they couldn't publish any more Tucker content and there was a certain day that it had to stop by. But I feel like it was a bit more of a petty, like Tucker's got to go and so does every single bit of his content. Like at the very least, yeah. I don't know, give the rights to them to publish it at yeah. some point. It's a shame. It's a shame. I'm sorry that happened. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... um. I've worked on, once you've worked in media, like I, I kind of go into every project assuming it might not get published or like your whole interview might get cut. That's just how it works. Like I've done a lot of, I did an interview last winter with like a mainstream CTV or something here in Canada that just, I have no idea what happened to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and right. you know, you take your time, you go do it. And half the time I feel it's like, oh, well, that interview was a little too good and had a few too many points. I guess we're going to cut the whole interview because oh. we can't embarrass like the Canadian, you know, dissident media personality. So we just won't do it. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> My gosh. Crypto. Oh, speaking of scam economy, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your take. Crypto. I have invested in crypto. I have, you know, worked with a ton of different exchanges before in the past and I have a lot of friends that are into crypto and over the last few years I've seen particularly from a Canadian perspective all of these exchanges shutting down going bankrupt having a billion lawsuits against them having the Canadian government put so many 
uh, so much pressure and new policies in place that they can barely function. And half my email inbox from all of the crypto stuff I was involved with like years ago is just like this account is shut down. This mm. one's shut down. This one like you have zero dollars in your account or you have this much. What do you want to do? You have like two days to get it out. And I just can't help but think that. And once again, this is just a Canadian perspective, though. Like I can't speak to like larger markets uh, and what people are seeing on their end. But Quadriga was one that I recently saw. Bitrex recent email about you know they're shut down. Um, I think that probably is making people a little worried about is this even going to be like a viable currency or like totally government controlled to the point that it's very difficult to use. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the government's intention on wanting to like tax and track all of your earnings, uh, you have to like scan your passport to put it into Coinbase and like get all mm -hmm. all your tax forms, everything like it has lost what made it really special when yeah. it becomes like that. Uh, you wanted crypto because you didn't want the government to know <laughs> what you were doing with your money, not so that they could track every single earning you're making and make sure they get their cut, too. Yeah. Once they have your wallet ID, they see even more. Than yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? It's So that's a bit um, disappointing. Ugh. But I don't know. Mm. Like there. I feel like those uh, cybernauts, the people, I, I, don't, I wouldn't trust myself to make those kind of predictions. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I feel like the uh, those folk that are really trying to create a revolution against the government on the internet with these different Web3, pro yeah, I, yeah. I barely understand okay. it, but I've been to their conferences. I respect them immensely. They've got all their different um, approaches. Um whether it be 3D printing guns like the Ghost Gunner site or the Web3 mm. people, uh, they're smarter than me. And I think they are enjoying the cat and mouse game. They're playing uh. with the government. And I feel like they'll always exist to some degree. You used to be a gamer. You play any games now? Um, I'm playing a lot of Mario. A okay. lot of Mario, Mario with my Kart. little one. Mario Kart. That's a... Mm. Always Mario Kart. Yeah. Um, Mario Party. Um, What's your console of choice? Super, what are you playing these on? I'm playing on Wii U, actually. Wii it's U. my Wii U from when I was younger, the one I bought. And the other day, my son saved over like <gasps> one of my first save files on it. And it was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, no. no, it's time for a new generation. <laughs> oh. no, but we enjoy it. I try to keep it like, you know, to a very um, moderated time. Luigi's it's Mansion. So exciting. To, yeah. That one's a little too spooky okay, right now. Yeah, okay. Um, what, what have I played recently on? I mean, when I did game a lot, it was lots of League of Legends. Like I used to play every day before school. It was not good. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. So the reason I brought that up is because of this comment three years ago uh, from an interview that we had. Uh, yeah, yeah. A virtual interview three years ago. Lauren confesses her gamer past and credentials. Kevin was about to propose until she revealed she only invests in crypto. Will there be a second date? Yes. <laughs> it seems like a lot has changed and now we're meeting in person. We are meeting in person again, yeah. Uh, why, do you hate gamers? Is this a... Me? Yeah. No, no. I, I, oh, I, no, it says you're about to... Pro okay, I'm yeah, understanding yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, I'm losing no, here, my look. brain. Yeah. Here we go. The issue is the not investing in anything but crypto. <laughs> have you, di oh, have yes, you diversified the crypt since Yes, then? I got to diversify the profile. <laughs> Fair. Well, apparently I'm just useless unless I buy property. Oh, no. <laughs> and I live in Vancouver, so I don't oh, know if they're no. ever coming back for another okay. interview. No. I, got, we, we, I have to buy Vancouver property in order to be acceptable here so, oh. in this space. <laughs> so related to this, earlier you guys had a sweet moment, so I'm going to try to get you to fight now. Um, oh, wonderful. No. Right? Let's go. So, Kevin, you've been an advocate for like, you know, if you have to spend some time away from hanging out with your friends and get the second or third job like now's the time to do it you know don't be lazy if you want to get ahead if you want to get the house <laughs> oh no it's Lauren, triggering. in one of your recent videos you said and i quote uh the next time you see someone who looks like they're about to go off on a zoomer about just skipping spending time with your friends to afford a house or get a second or third job let them know that these kids these days aren't all just lazy sjw's with nose piercings and a little bit later you say there's some damn hardworking ones referring to zoomers out there they have just not been given any of the tools or a lot of them any of the tools or understanding of what's gone wrong and how to fix it and it's our job to help fill in those blanks for the institutions and so media true. i don't and know in who some this cases is, their parents have failed them <laughs> wow fight 
Yeah, I, well, I think it does come back to like that baseline again, where you come from. Um, and my baseline is very much the conservative pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but also mm. the people that I've been around. I'm in a very like high functioning space uh, on both the autism spectrum and the work spectrum. <laughs> like politics, all of these people are work 24 seven, right? Mm. Work so much that you need to be taken double Adderalls to like keep working. So that, and so where the place I'm coming from, I'm looking at the commentator sphere and they're like, these kids aren't working hard enough. And I'm I'm like, you're working too hard. Like, you need to chill. Do you have a social life outside of this? You know, like a lot of those people, I'm like, it would do you well to take a break and relax. So that's where my baseline is coming from. And that's also, once again, when you have people who are addicted to work critiquing people for not working enough, it, it rings a little more hollow. <laughs> oh, oh, do we have someone who's addicted to work here? Well, probably. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Uh, I actually think we need more of exactly what you just said. I, I think my whole theme today has been like, how can Lauren post more videos? Because I actually think that's yeah, you want me to become like you people. You want me to join, <laughs> look into the abyss, and no, have think... the abyss look back into me and become an internet addict even more. <laughs> no, we, we selfishly need you to tell us to work less. <laughs> there, okay, okay, fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. <laughs> it's like. So uh, this is a perfect place to shout out that we did a great talk on your uh, channel, I, I don't know, or wherever you'll post it, but we did this great talk on trying to evaluate, like there's this balance between what lifestyle you wanna choose and how much you wanna work. And there is a way you can balance having a fulfilling job and, uh, and, and building wealth versus maybe giving up. I think maybe is that a synopsis, finding mm -hmm. that balance, I think we could say. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's also fair for you to bring up that, yeah, like there is struggle right now, right? With you were quoting your video about how there's struggle in Zoomers who are trying to work a full time job, and once they add in their commute, they they don't have time to work out or spend time with friends or family or whatever else, and that feels unbalanced. So then the question becomes, how do you fix that? Right. And the best way to win people over, whether it be a political debate, you know, talking to friends economics doesn't matter is to acknowledge where someone is right and yeah. then give them where you think you're right and they don't understand but if you're not acknowledging where they're right they're not going to believe anything you're saying zoomers know firsthand what the economy and job markets and the housing costs are like oh, yeah. it's out there you can look at the data like their purchasing power is like 86 87 percent less than boomers that's not invented right and they know this so when you look at them and you say well no we worked harder than you and we're in the same economy and you're just being lazy, they're gonna look at you and not believe a single thing you say. So right. if you want them to work harder, you say, you're right. Yeah, this yes. economy is messed up. Exactly mm -hmm. your approach, it is messed up. There's a lot wrong here, mm -hmm. but you still gotta keep fighting. Yeah. Yeah. That you, they're going to listen to you when you actually acknowledge the reality that they're living in. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. I didn't even think about it from that perspective. But yeah, it, trying to think of like, because I remember that video, the one that you're talking about, because I've watched it as well. And it's it's touching because the person is frustrated. Like, hey, I, I work at eight in the morning and I've got to commute and I can't afford to live close to my work. So I have to, you know, I don't get home until six or whatever. Uh, and that is hard and it does suck. And then, then you know, how, how do we solve from from there? Well, you know, the only solutions are, well, let's start with what other hours do we have? Well, we have all of Saturday, we have all of Sunday, we have the hours before work and the hours after work. If those become unproductive because of the depression and frustration of that core, say 50 hours, and the other 70 hours of the week go to waste, then, then let's start solving for waste. I think you made a really good point here with the kind of TikTok reels culture where it's like something that used to take five minutes takes 30 minutes. You go to the washroom and then you spend, you know, an extra 20 minutes on top of that, like scrolling your phone, getting stuck there. You're going to bed, you're staying up an extra few hours and then you sleep in more because you were scrolling your phone. Mm -hmm. And so that time that would have been spent doing fulfilling things, making it feel like you're living your life is disappearing and getting consumed by technological progress and all yeah. of these influencers that need your eyes 24 seven to make their own careers, which is once again my criticism of a bit of the online yes, <laughs> culture. Yes, yeah, that's true. And, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I think it's also this problem of, okay, you go to work and then 
you have nothing fulfilling outside of yeah, it. You need something. Be and it, you really, we have to work to change that culture of prioritizing real relationships, oh, real. And COVID's wrecked that too, being yeah. people being stuck indoors. So I'm not surprised that they've created these compulsions and addictions with their phones mm -hmm. when all of the healthy habits they used to have have been so hammered out of existence by horrible government policy and lockdown. And uh, even like the dance studios the climbing gyms all these places you would go to the small businesses just yeah, out, even outside of covid just the taxation the pressure on this middle class that could create these experiences is uh, causing a lot of these things to collapse so yeah uh, without the balance of a meaningful real social world um, and instead, you've got a bunch of delusional internet addicts that have been forced onto their computers and into these like very hateful realities where they're taught to hate the other gender. They're not forming real relationships. Mm. It's of course, people are not going to want to work. It's like, wow, I'm working for nothing. And by nothing, I don't even mean the money. I mean life. Fulfillment. Yeah. Fulfillment. <laughs> so speaking of this, uh, you know, lack of fulfillment and the Zoomers, I guess, work life balance. What are your thoughts on the concept of quiet quitting? It doesn't surprise me. I mean, yeah, the, so the concept of quiet quitting, I talked about this a bit in that video. It's like where you basically just put in the bare minimum effort. Uh, and and I, I spoke a bit about this when it really feels like you are never going to get ahead. You're never going to own a house. You're never going to get that promotion. Even if you do stay at this company, eventually you'll probably be fired and replaced with someone from overseas that will work for less. It's like you, there, there needs to be mutual loyalty. And I will say there is a problem with like, repeatedly not putting more effort into life and then wondering why you're not getting ahead. That's a problem that you can diagnose in the Zoomers. But then you can also look at the corporations and say, is there a mutual loyalty here? There's not. We know there's not. We know you would destroy the lives of every single one of your employees to save a dollar on their paycheck and hire someone else. You don't care. I, I think that when businesses were smaller and we didn't have corporations becoming the main employer of everyone in a town, you know, we you can see it. You can see the small towns that used to have the local coffee shop, the local, you know, butcher. They're all getting replaced by supermarkets. Yeah. Nobody knows the CEOs. Nobody knows the people they're working for, and they don't know them. Their numbers on a chart. There's not going to be a mutual loyalty. People aren't going to feel like, oh, this is my neighbor Rick, and I know he's going to give me a Christmas bonus, and I know I'm building up my own community. Yeah, I'll do the bare minimum because you'll do the bare minimum for me. In fact, you'll eat my town and our souls for an extra few numbers on your checkbook at the end of the year. Like you do not care for us. People care as much for the corporations as the corporations care for them. It's simple as that. How do you solve that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with government government meddling. I mean, look at COVID. Uh, I, I was in Australia at the time. And the stores that were allowed to stay open, it's like, oh, Kmart or whatever gets to stay open. Right. Oh, like Loblaws or whatever the Australian version, Woolies, uh, Woolsworth gets to stay open. And it was literally like none of the small businesses could survive. And the large businesses got all of the consumers sure. the forcefully sure. sent to them. Um, mm. The airlines that get bailed out by governments, mm. the tax cuts, the uh, even just like once again, the immigration, the ability to just bring in essentially a slave labor class. These are very real problems that are being distorted in the public eye. Uh, people are being lied to by our media class. Um, oh, you're a racist if you criticize this. Oh, you want to kill grandma if you criticize this. A lot of emotional man manipulation to the public. These are things our political class could look at more reasonably, but um, it it's much easier to grease the wheels of people's friends and, and the nepotism that's <laughs> going on than to and, and to like give a bit of an emotional bone to the public to run mm -hmm. after and have them fight amongst one another. Oh, you're it's your fault. It's your fault. It's men's fault. It's women's fault. Oh. You're trying to kill my grandma. You're like, trying to manufactured like do you uh, think yeah. do you think some of the dare I say the uh you know transgender uh, women in men or um how should I describe this? Biological men who are now identifying as women in women's sports. Are some of these things manufactured crises? Okay, or? this is perhaps going to be the most controversial thing I say on this podcast, but um, podcast, oh gosh, horrific. Oh no. <laughs> I don't want to, sorry, this does not identify as a podcast. It's a show. It's, it's a show. show. <laughs> um, I think the transgender issue 
is one of the least of our worries civilizationally. And I think it's way overhyped by conservative media. And if you look at who makes the most money off of transgenderism and the topic, if you look at like Facebook ads and clicks and everything, conservative media makes insane amounts of money off of this subject. Oh, wow. Like the people profiting the most off of us all talking about it and it being in the public consciousness is conservative media. And I get why they do it because I do think that there is a massive issue of uh, people just denying reality like the idea that men can go into women's sports is obviously delusional and anyone who's being honest with themselves left, left wing or right wing whether you believe that we should be respecting people's pronouns or not like we obviously have different biology and I get why conservatives harp on it but it's also <laughs> I think immigration the economy um, these kind of issues are deserve 10 times the amount of attention that we're giving to this transgender stuff but it's like you have to look at the transgender stuff as uh, just a home run every time you talk about it because it's so obvious that the left wing are wrong on it and you always want to be getting a home run when you're a media mm. individual you never want to be wrong you always if you can just harp on something you know you're mm. right on that the other side's going to fight you on over and over and over again it's just an easy win and you're going to make money 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 embarrass win 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 wow. win right so it's like, yeah, I think it needs to be talked about a lot mm -hmm. less, but not because it's like I disagree or think that, oh, yeah, men should be allowed or trans trans whatever should be allowed in women's sports. I think that's that's crazy. I don't think we should be cruel or unnecessarily mean. Obviously not. I think that's I, I think if anything, um, people who genuinely have gender dysphoria are going through some of the most difficult times in their life and, and need love. And I know people who are transgender, who who I love as human beings, right? Um, but it, once again, I think it's harped on because it's just a knock out of the park every time. And wow. um, as much as I think it's tragic, very tragic for what, what's being done to young people. Like I have people I also know who have detransitioned and the government like paid for their entire surgery, like cut off their genitals, left them like that, didn't pay, you know, they, they feel like their life has been torn apart by this propaganda um the the amount of th there's also uh, there are a lot of issues tearing people's lives apart that should probably be getting an equal amount of attention but they're just they're harder they're harder to address they're not mm -hmm. as cut and dry so it's easier for media to just focus on a more cut and dry issue of like okay maybe we shouldn't be allowing like six-year-olds to change their gender which is oh, like that's yeah. crazy maybe we shouldn't be cutting off minors genitals like i get it once again i get it i get why conservative media focus on it so much because it is a home run and it is so obvious but um mm. everything goes back to lauren needs to make more videos it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just i think like once again it, it's how many different times can we say it? Mm -hmm. Like, how many different times can we say it? And how many different ways? And, and there an are easy, more complex... It's hanging fruit to make it's, money. It's low-hanging mm -hmm. fruit. And there are more more complex issues that we probably, like the hardest hitters within our intellectual or commentary sphere probably need to be spending more time grappling, but less people want to see that. Mm -hmm. People, It's like what well, you guys asked me why I have a uh, grave digger truck in the office. And it's like, because <laughs> grave digger is the best. Grave digger <laughs> always wins. I don't want the underdog to win. I just want grave digger to win every time. <laughs> grave digger. Grave like, yeah! digger. <laughs> like, people love that. It's predictable. It's awesome. <laughs> but um, no, when you're talking about the social and political psyche of your population, we probably need to gamify that <laughs> a bit less and have hard conversations. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. Hey, by the way, if you want to watch myself and Mikey not only react to clips from these different interviews that we do, but also join us at the, the Meet Kevin and Mikey podcast, click the link down below and subscribe to the Meet Kevin and Mikey podcast channel. Link down below. Do you ever think you're too harsh on boomers, too critical of boomers? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no, not enough. <laughs> <sighs> I think it's funny because once again, this is a group that like boomers massively support conservative media. So like being critical and questioning and being like, okay, but like 
is it really all just stupid Gen Z and millennials? Are you sure like we weren't raised in a political and social system that already had some things messed up with it? Like saying that isn't necessarily going to be a lucrative approach or an approach that's going to make you super popular. But I think that that introspection and criticizing the things that isn't necessarily beneficial for you to criticize is how you improve things. Mm. <laughs> and I, I, if I saw that the conservative movement became every single person in Gen Z and millennials saying everything was boomers fault, um, you'd probably see me flip around and start being like, okay, Gen Z millennials, let's look inward. But I, I'm always, mm. I've, I've got a horrible compulsion. That's like devil's advocate. I got to like talk about the side that I feel isn't being talked about. And it's very unhelpful for my, <laughs> Oh. political career so to speak <laughs> well i thank you for doing that <laughs> to bringing the other perspective thank you. i can't help it <laughs> <laughs> i wish i could <laughs> but you know what i mean to sympathize uh maybe even empathize uh i get so passionate about the finance topics uh that uh i will say things that i know people will disagree with, but it's what I believe. And mm -hmm. it's much like you said, it, like it, just to give you a sample, in finance now, if you wanted to make a, get a lot of views, just talk about for sure, the housing market crashes around the corner. Mm. Great views, the great reset. <laughs> That's why I found it so interesting this morning when you were like, no, 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 they can keep up this Ponzi scheme for 100 years. I was like, I've listened to a lot of housing market people <laughs> and I really like the ones that tell me the housing market is crashing this summer. I didn't like hearing that, but that's interesting because no one says that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was at breakfast this morning. Yeah. You were shocked. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's because that idea that does, that is not popular. It's not shareable. It's not going to get as many views uh, compared to, you know, don't worry, everything's going to great reset in six months. So that's my retirement plan, right? <laughs> that's every, yeah. That's every Gen <laughs> Z's life plan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, reset, I'll just wait yeah. for the reset. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It reminds me of that clip of Ann Coulter when she was on Bill Maher's show and um, they asked her, well, who do you think is going to win president of the United States or the nomination? And she said, Donald Trump. And the entire crowd laughed at her, mm -hmm. mocked her, everyone on. That, and she just sat there like she actually looked a little you know, nervous. Oh, like, yeah. It's it's pretty like humiliating experience to have an entire crowd and everyone sitting at the desk at you, laughing at you, mocking you. And then he won. Yeah. And I always love playing that clip as much as, you know, Ann Coulter came around and was like, doesn't like Trump anymore. Um, wow, her prediction was right. And we do yeah. not treat people right who do not go with the popular prediction. That's yeah, for sure. <laughs> that is 100% true. Okay, last question I have. Star Wars is now going to be directed by somebody who has openly said that they're, they love making men uncomfortable. What's your reaction to this? Sometimes I wonder, because I was part of this like when I was uh, yeah, just starting in this sphere, you would like go and say and do things that you knew would piss off the media <laughs> and the left wing because you found it funny. And even if you knew they were misunderstanding you and they thought like, like when uh, there's a story about me shooting flare guns at immigrants and like killing a bunch of children or something in the Mediterranean. And, you know, that's not true. <laughs> but, <laughs> to <be clear. laughs> not to be clear. Yeah. But like, I would almost play on it sometimes or I'd say like, oh, like maybe I did it. Or you'd like put up one of these like uh. when Media Matters was in the room and then they'd picture it and be like white nationalist hand sign or dog <laughs> whistle. And then he'd be with all your friends and you'd see the article and you just hysterically laugh and think it was funny. Um, and there would be a lot of people who would read that or watch that. And oh, what did I say? There was something... There was something I said when I was leaving Australia to an out outlet. I can't remember if they were like, do you need, do we need immigration, Lauren? Like, what about all the beautiful things that immigrants contribute to our world? Like the different foods and everything. And I just was like, huh, we already have the recipes, like kick them all out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, awesome. something like that. And then they publish it and they're so shook. They're so like, this is the most horrific thing we've ever heard in our life. And me and my like, film team are just like we's laughing on the plane and we just thought it was just hilarious how upset yeah. and like uh -huh. impressed these people and i wonder if the left wing kind of do that to their own degree like people mm. who are in kind of progressive spheres she's like what if i said i just want to like upset men and mm. like that's 95 percent of our audience like how hilarious would that be yeah. um but then there's also the side where you really do have genuine marxist like 
radicals that exist within the institutions that really do want these things. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I discovered, you know, being in my own political sphere of the right wing, like you'd be in a group of people and you'd be laughing at a joke. And then like there'd be one person in the group of 10 that would be like, so we all want to kill them. Right. And you're like, oh. What? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's like no, oh, no. Uh, that's like an example, yeah, but you yeah, know, yeah. like in a, more like an online like Twitter sphere. Yeah, yeah. Like you'd see a comment and you'd be like, what? <laughs> I don't think you were quite understanding. Um, and I think it's probably a higher number within the progressive left wing sphere where it's like, oh no, but we actually do really want communism and we really do want to like oppress men and, and white people. And you know, I've met with groups like black first land first in South Africa where they're like, oh yeah, we need to like kill the boar. And I'm like, oh, oh, you actually want to kill people who look like me. Okay. You know, and these like real genuine radicals do exist. And so boar being a reference to... I mean Kill the boar. Yeah, uh, the boar people are uh, white South the Africans. Uh, yeah, okay, so nice. they want to kill the boar. Nice. Like, yeah, Got it. Okay. they have a lot of songs. They sing about it. In uh, my head just went there. to World of Warcraft. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like, you know, level three boar. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I wish. The okay. South Africans, uh, uh, the I mean, wish very much that's what they were okay, talking okay, about. Fine. But um, so like there's one side of me that's like. God, I sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's also not a good source of experience. Just do the quest line. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So I think there's like one side where it's like, could this be like genuine? Just wanting to like rage bait and upset people and get attention and like kind of finding it funny. Or is this more sinister? And that's the that's the internet today. Oh, you can't wow. tell what. It's genuine. Bait. You no longer can tell when people genuinely believe in the things they're saying because there yeah. are like. But like is... you said, you played into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are, and then I, and then you go back and you're like, why do people think I'm like this? <laughs> it's like, oh, Lauren, you rage baited. <laughs> um, but then you also see these like stories on the internet, especially in the gender stuff, where they'll be like, I just went on a date with a girl who told me that she's stolen like four million dollars from men off of divorce court or whatever or vice versa like a girl being like this man just slapped me and slapped the girl in the taxi and said you know kill all women and ran away i'm so sad like retweet me and you'll see like eighty thousand retweets on a story that's so obviously made up for attention and this is and, and you know, I don't even think it necessarily has to come from an ideological standpoint. People will throw an ideological slant into it for the purpose of accessing certain communities within the replies. But um, I, I think people, especially on Elon Musk's Twitter, where you can make Elon bucks, <laughs> they just are like, all right, what's going to really upset people today? If I make mm. up a story and what's going to what are people really going to want to discourse about today? Right, right. And, and that goes viral. It goes viral. Yeah. So I think there's genuinely a, a bunch of people <laughs> in marketing offices at home thinking I can literally just lie. I can literally just upset people. Who cares? This is the Internet. It's not real. <laughs> That's but very then unhealthy. There's a bunch of people that are like, "This is real." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's real, and it's, it no, it. it's the internet. So, <laughs> what do you do? You just accept. Hmm. Mm. Well, <laughs> I guess this is a bit of where my paralysis comes from because I look at topics mm. and it's like, okay, the transgender stuff. I see people where I'm like, okay, you guys really have had like a horrible experience. You have, you know, been transitioned, like literally cut your genitals apart and regret it and feel that you were indoctrinated into it and feel the government paid and, and like, wow, that's really awful. And then you have people that are like sharing like the 400th edit of, you know, some drag queen story hour that you find out was actually part of a pride parade. You don't really know the story behind it. Like there's been stuff added to it. And it's like, what is real? What isn't? What's AI? What's made up? And it's like, because because, you know, that's something that's going to get attention. And you really have to that's where part of the having to look at people in the eyes and meet them face to face comes into. Not to say people can't lie, but you can lie a lot better on the internet. You can pretend to be anyone on the internet. <laughs> um, so it, I really, it takes a level of discernment. I've been, I've been helping people a little bit in the background. Like when I think people are falling for fake stories or vice yeah. versa, I'll kind of call them up and be like, here's the digging I did. I found out this is fake or that is fake. And it comes from, you know, being on the internet my whole life since I was a little kid and then working in this sphere for 10 years, you kind of get a little bit more of a bullshit detector. Yeah, but yeah. then how do you, 
awaken everyone to that. School I doesn't think, help. Pardon? School doesn't help much. No, it definitely doesn't. And mm -hmm. I think young people are a little better because they spend more time on the internet. Like the people who are falling for most of the scam calls and scam yeah, emails yeah. are going to be boomers. But then also like boomers and older generations have most of the money and control most of these outlets and are spending a lot of time on the internet. It's just a messy world. It's the Wild West out there. <laughs> so where do you put someone like Alex Jones on that? Hmm. I mean, didn't he say in court that he was like, it's an act or whatever? And it's like, is he saying that just because he's in court right. or is it actually an act? Right, right, right. So because it, that's a d potential defense, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or does he know what he's saying is outlandish? I don't I don't know. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, I look at one account. I'm very happy for them, but there was this account called like women posting L's, right? And it just posts whenever women like do stupid things or are idiots. And like a lot of the responses like genuinely hate women, right? Jeez. They're like, wow, I love this. I'm like jerking off to this like hate porn because I'm I just like love hating this other gender and it's pretty unhealthy. But then you look at the person who curates it and uh the the person who owns the account actually ended up getting married to one of the girls whose L's he posted a while ago, which I think is a very cute, like, irony. you know, irony. Yeah. But then it goes to show you, like, how serious are these people about the content that they're spreading? Like, uh. do you really, like, you're, you know, you've got an audience of people that in a lot of cases, they see the woman posting the L and they're like, wow, I hate her, like, we hate women, woohoo. And then it's like, okay, but then the person curating the account is actually quite happy and quite normal and probably isn't, <laughs> you know, with a lot of what their audience wow. are saying and getting married and able to create real relationships between yeah. communities that on the internet want to, like, kill each other, right? And I think that's, I think that's actually a big difference between the people consuming media and the people creating media is I've spent a lot of time in rooms with people who are the creators of media that are on all different sides of the political spectrum that want to like kill each other on the internet or even act like they do. And then in a room together, they're all just kind of having a laugh and having a drink together. And that was like one of the most shocking experiences when I first got into media was like seeing, I don't want to bring it up again. <laughs> this is just such drama, but like people that the internet thought were mortal enemies, essentially like having drinks and having a laugh and like laughing about all the people who thought they were mortal enemies. <laughs> and I was like, what? Is okay, going you got name names. <laughs> no, I'm, <not>. <laughs> Very <laughs> I'm well. done with We that. won't tell anyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's listening. <laughs> wow, Lauren, this is amazing. How can people follow you? Yeah, you can find me at Lauren underscore Southern on the Twitters. X, it will always be Twitter to me. Lauren Southern on YouTube. And then I'm also at Tenet Media, spelt like the movie, but with media at the end. You can find a lot of my videos and new little mini documentaries there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me, you guys. This was fun. <laughs> Taylor Swift yep. was named yeah, Person of the Year by Time Magazine last year. Mm. Do you have any thoughts about Taylor Swift, her achievements in the music industry, her activism, or her tour or anything Taylor, like that? I think Taylor Swift is an American princess. She is a queen. She can do no wrong in my eyes. There is like a right wing perception that's like, oh, well, she supported Biden and Kelsey or whatever his name is, like said the vaccines were good. They're libtards. They're, they're normies. Of course, they're going to say these things. If Taylor Swift gets married and has babies. If you think that that won't heal American gender relations overnight, you are insane. They literally look like that classic like 50s American football star and cheerleader couple. It is going we need like a picture of them like that wartime picture of the girl leaning over being kissed. They get married, they have children. All of the Swifties decide they want husbands too that are strong alpha like football players and America is healed overnight, all gender relations fixed. I don't, listen, you gotta let go. They're, they're libtards, they're, they're, managers told them tweet this support biden whatever they went okay but no they're beautiful excellent physiognomy they, they are going to save uh gender relations in america that's my opinion <laughs> will you start posting more no <laughs> <laughs> no further questions we tried let's let's go back home it's uh you belong with me i like that one fearless fearless okay I'm like, I know the like, I, I'm, not, I'm not like a massive listen to Taylor Swift, but I like the idea of her culturally. And I like how wholesome and upbeat the music is. And you know, 
she doesn't for for all the complaining that I see about Taylor Swift this Taylor Swift that is she really doing worse things to the American culture than the people who all their songs are about like slapping their butts like and you know shooting a n-word and like mm. you know have 10 baby daddies like is that oh it's Taylor Swift is the problem we need to deal with in the music culture really okay I think you just like hating white women <laughs> What a way to end it. <laughs> Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purposes of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services we may benefit from. I also also personally operate an actively managed ETF and hold long positions in various securities mentioned, including potential short positions. However, I have no relationship to any issuers, nor am I presently acting as a market maker.